All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to part two of linear models. I hope you're doing good. So uh, last time yesterday, we stopped at, uh, we started discussing a gradient descent, which is an iterative uh, algorithm to solve an optimization problem. So we were focusing on linear regression uh, and we saw this uh, analytical solution to solve it, but then we thought there are like, can there be another way of doing it? Probably uh, going to this delta j tending to zero, right? So we are trying to see rather than putting delta j equal to zero, we want to iterate to delta j tending to zero. So, uh, so we looked at this example where we're talking about this bowl-shaped function, which is the loss surface. And we discussed about how a point on the loss surface corresponds to a, a red line or any line on this plane and vice versa, any, any line on this plane corresponds to a point on this surface. So we found out that because it's the convex optimization problem, we have a guaranteed minima where the local minima is same as global minima. So, so, so the parameters or the this coordinate on this 3D plane is at the bottom most point is basically the best fit uh, parameters for the line, which would best fit this plot on this graph, right? And that means if you take now all the residual errors from this plot, and you sum them up, take the mean square error, that would be the same as the J value for this point on this graph, right? So, so we, uh, we were talking about gradients as the way to find out which direction we should move in the plane, be it this level curve plane or at this bowl shape, right? So this is just equivalent to each other in terms of representation. So we wanted to move in a direction of maximum decrease in function value. Like, and that maximum decrease in function value can be interpreted as move in direction negative to the gradient. So we should be moving in the direction directly opposite the gradient, right? So that's what we quickly to recap. That's what we discussed. So, so we ended the discussion last time around here, where our goal is that we are starting with, so this is a plot of just say, let's say W0. So from two parameters, W0 comma W1, which is there for a line, right? So let's say this is a part for just for W1, right? So our goal is we are starting from any random W and, and we have to, reach this w star which is at this sweet spot right so if we are starting with any random w it has a corresponding point on this plot right so it has a corresponding point it can from either side because you're going to start from a random initial wave and then the whole idea is you need to move in the direction of opposite gradient because if you see at this plot the gradient is towards the direction of increasing function so we move in the negative direction of that gradient so that means if that is the W, you need to decrease the W, right? So, and if, so if your gradient is positive, so if you take the half, your gradient is positive on this side and negative on this side, the actual gradient, right? The slope of this line, right? And here, the slope is equal to zero, just at the middle. So if you are at the positive side of the gradient, you need to decrease your W, right? So on this half, W needs to be decreased, the weight one, and, and this half W1 needs to be increased. It depends wherever you are, right? But you don't need to find out wherever you are because the gradient would do that information. So gradient, so here gradient is negative. Here gradient, I'm calling it as G for the shortcut notation. This is positive, right? So, so the way it is that since we have to move in the negative gradient direction, so our weight update, so our weight, you can see here that because we have to always move in the opposite of the gradient direction, what we have done here is we have written an equation which is the weight update. So at any iteration 
T plus one, right? So you will need to iteratively reach the sweet spot. So if you have T plus one as the new iteration or as the next iteration, the W at the next iteration. So the update on W at T plus one is equal to the current W at T, right? Minus, there is some kind of a constant or a factor here called as learning rate or step size. Okay. And that means, and, and then there is this delta JW, right? So that means your W will be equal to W present minus learning rate into gradient. So what it means is, uh, so you are taking small, small steps towards your center of this curve, right? Center of these uh, level curves. So when you're starting from the most the outermost side here, so you your target is to keep on keep taking these steps in the direction uh, with with an amount of change called as delta j, right? So 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 that is the term which you need to subtract from w in order to move towards w. Now you don't have to worry about the sign of delta j because Delta J is the gradient. So, so this is the G I was talking about, right? So let's see if we are on this right hand side of this curve. So that means my Delta J, which is G gradient is positive because every here, every here, your gradient is positive, right? So that means I am decreasing my W. So W minus e step size into uh, some positive quantity. So I'm decreasing my W. If I'm on the left hand side of this plot, then my Delta J is, uh, uh, delta J is negative because your slope of this line here is negative. So your gradient is negative on this half. So Delta J is negative value. The negative negative would be positive. So you are going in the right hand side direction. So your W is getting increased from its previous value, right? So that is this whole idea why this formula is there. There can be other ways of writing this formula, but for the sake of this lecture, I'm concerned about writing as a minus sign in between which gives me an intuition that my W is moving towards this uh, direction. But sometimes you might find in literature that they might write, write a plus here and then write minus G here, right? Which is the same effect, negative gradient. So now what is the step size? So step size is the amount of, uh, 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 step size is how, how much you would want to move in every iteration, right? Like it's a, it's like it controls how quickly you want to or how slowly you want to go to that minima. So if your step size is too small, then as an example here, you can see that your W, this corresponding W here is updating slowly and slowly, right? It's like it's taking small, small precautionary measures, like small, small steps before you reach the minima. Now in this case, you can see that in terms of this 3D plot, it's like moving like this, right? It's like taking these small, small types. So it's not clearly seen here, but in this case, there would be a like small, small step, like, and then you reached at the bottom most point. Whereas if uh, step size is too large, that means you are jumping, right? So that means you are just moving from one level surface to the other level surface. So the whole idea is your error is decreasing. So the whole idea is, is, here is the error should decrease. Right? Your error is decreasing. So you're moving from here. If you start from here, here. So you are just going like crazily down this uh, uh, this graph. So that means there can be a situation where you might actually diverge as well, right? So if you might think of it like you're going like this, this and crazily, it might offshoot and take you at a large, at two, at some value which can take it to. So the whole idea is to converge. But if you are jumping randomly here and there, here and there, it might happen that if the curve, this curve is somewhere like this, right? It's not that sharp. Then it might happen that it might even escape it. So uh, in, in, in that aspect, you can see here that the best way is to find somewhere in between these two extremities, not too small, not too large. And it also depends on the sharpness of this curve. So, idea is to have a variable NT just right 
author okay so but that is also not practically chosen at least at this stage when i'm showing you an example but you see that flavor of it with having i don't know if you might have heard of these terms like momentum adding a momentum like as you are rolling down the slope you gather momentum and that will take you to that uh, lowest mode point and to just throw some optimizers you might have heard of adam optimizer in deep learning right and when when you will study about deep learning you will hear about lot of these optimizers so the goal of these optimizers like adam there is nestor a uh, nestor of accelerated gradient rms prop so what these things do is they try to update these uh, this term like are do you want to add the actual gradient or do you want to add some other form of this gradient which can be having a momentum term or something which clearly leads to you to that but the whole intuition is when you are away from that minima take large steps but as you come close to that minima you might want to slow it down so that you make sure you are going to that uh, desired point so in terms of this uh, level plots you can see here that you might incur large oscillations in y axis which makes you move like jump across these level curves in this uh, vertical direction while your overall aim is to have the momentum towards horizontal axis right so you want to decrease your uh, oscillations from top to bottom right so you want to decrease your uh, vertical uh, vertical uh, what do you want to say vertical part of that step that you're taking so you would want to go as quickly as possible to the center horizontally so there's a thing called like smoothing oscillations right like on an average what you do is you using all these variable uh, that was an example of variable step size but also in terms of gradients like i talk about rms prop momentum and all those factors right so those are the factors that you want to change your gradient and have a momentum term associated with your gradient so what they would do is do something like this right they would try to average out the oscillation so that you quickly reach the center so the whole optimization research is all about how quickly you want to go to local minima any questions so far Are there any questions on the chat? I don't see any questions. Anyone has any questions? So for all practical matters, we will take a constant step size. Nothing on YouTube. Are there any questions on YouTube? Uh, no, nothing there. Okay, so let's continue then. There's something on the chat. These oscillations are decided using learning rate, right? these oscillations are decided using learning rate uh so in this case uh, yes i would say uh, that learning rate might decide how quickly you would want to or how aggressively you want to jump right and this is also something a kind of a parameter that you would want to estimate from yourself it's not a parameter that the model learns so it's like a hyper parameter to this uh, step so, so, so this me, is... yeah let me add to it if i may um, so no, think of no. a, think of a single weight right so with a single weight let's assume that your loss uh, function is a parabola ax square plus bx aw square plus bw plus c okay so now your a has to be positive for the function to be convex correct now for this particular case we know exactly what the center is we exactly know what the minima is it's um, i i believe it is minus uh, b by 2a you can figure it out by setting the derivative to zero pardon me if i am saying it wrongly but there is there is a fixed value in terms of b and a uh, fixed value of w which will give you the lowest value now for any given point on in the w space uh, w and loss space there are infinitely many parabolas that are going through it that have the exactly the same value at that point and the same derivative also what is different between them is just second derivative okay. so uh, whether you will oscillate or not depends on two things one is uh, what is your step size 
and second thing is what is your second derivative if your second derivative is too large then you want to take a smaller step size if your second derivative uh, or otherwise you will oscillate right overall steps i'm talking about yeah and uh, so so second derivative is something that we don't compute usually because it's expensive to compute so we rely on first derivative and a time series of first derivatives right so that yeah so that exactly what it is curvature is second derivative is related to the curvature so we rely on first derivative and series of first derivative at each iteration to approximate the second derivative and it's inverse okay could you go to the soothing part of the the soothing graph in which you are soothing the oscillations normalize the so it would not be an elliptical part elliptical or surface kind of thing i could not hear the question because it was breaking yeah i couldn't hear it either so so my question is basically uh, i thought that we were supposed to normalize the features so um, first of all in which case would we still see the elliptical surface uh, uh yes because uh, it's not just the derivative because when you are looking at multiple uh multiple weights right so it's actually not in feature space we are not talking about x space anymore we are talking about w space these contours are in w space not in x space okay so uh for multiple w's uh you can have uh, a covariance matrix which has uh in such a way that it is elliptical and not circular circular would mean that it is uh, a multiple of identity matrix the, the covariance uh, matrix uh, so if you are taking the example of a linear regression yeah okay so elliptical is totally possible you okay. can have one major eigen value and one smaller eigen value to give you an elliptical uh, contours okay uh, the next question is in the in the graph i understand that we need to decrease decrease the vertical oscillations but um, does this can we uh, relate to this um, thing in like in terms of words like what are we actually trying to decrease here in terms of some or some so it's about it's about so this graph the first graph is doing this right so it's moving to different levels see so so right now this it's like doing this right in this case you can see the point a and b are like more or less at the same level right so it's trying to stick to its same level and slowly and slowly approaching the minima so in this case what you would want to do is like where whenever you are at this step you would want to you would want to go to a surface and as you're going down the surface you're gathering some kind of uh, so in this case like it's combination of momentum as well uh, in this case because as you're going down what you need to do is like if, so let's say if you want to explain it in your way for me i'm not able to put it in words right now like i'm just trying to figure out if if we are emphasizing some part of w matrix in this by doing this or w w w is this one that we want to learn w star Yeah. Right, and in this and in this case, this is some value which is cost of J W. Yeah. Right. So this is same as saying we are taking cross sections of this graph. So if you can understand in terms of this curvature where we are moving it like this, then yeah. it's just a projection of that journey on a two D plane. Okay. right so in this case you can imagine the curvature to be like this and a and b are more or less at the same level right so if if this is the same level of a so b is somewhere here right just close to that same level and then your c is here your d is here your e is here okay right? yeah got it got it got it got it got it okay cool so 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 now if you have to recall the linear regression cost function and suppose let's say let's take this data that we had right where we had only one x which is a scalar and we had points and we wanted to fit this line 
right? So if you can see here that I've just taken two parameters because for a one feature space, this plot of line would have two parameters, slope and intercept. So I'm taking as W0, W1. So now if you write the gradients of this, right? So you can go through this. Hopefully you've gone over this derivation and pre-read or maybe later today. Just do that derivation uh, or uh, derivatives of delta J, which is like partial derivatives in W0 and W1. So after that, what you would eventually end up is this equation, right? So you will end up with this equation. And then what this, this is telling you is in terms of notations of matrix, this basically means this is one row of X. So if you remember your X was basically one X1, one X2, one Xn, N sample. So this is N cross two, right? So this is just one row, one ith ith row of this X. Yi is just a scalar quantity, which is small yi. That means in the big vector of y, which is labeled, just take this one yi, right? It's a label. And W is anyways my two cross one, right? So, so you can correlate from here. So once you have that equation, now what we're trying to, so this was for uh, with respect to W0. Now if you do with respect to W1, you would have this X, extra term which comes up here right what i have done simply is i have written jw0 jw1 right and i have only taken the values which are dependent on w0 i have only taken the values which are dependent on w1 and rest of the terms are just treated as constant for w0 here there's, there might be an, there is a term which is purely on W1, but for W0, it's a constant to take a partial derivative. For W1, there is again a term here, which constant term, which is with respect to W0, but then that would be equal to zero when I take the derivative with respect to W1. So after you do that, what you would have is, this is the equation for partial derivative of J with respect to W0. And when you come to W1, you would see that the equation is more or less the same but then there is this extra term, right? So this one, this one, so this one, this one is the extra term that I'm talking about. It's again the same thing, but there's an extra term comes up, right? So if I have to club this into one equation, what I would do is I will go back to the standard definition of Delta J, put them one below each other, right? So this is from, this is from Delta J with respect to W zero, right? This is delta J with respect to W1. And then I can put them in a matrix notation where this is a constant, right? So re remember this is a this is a scalar quantity. This quantity here is scalar, right? One cross two, two cross one, and this is one, one cross one, right? So this is a scalar quantity. Again, this is the same scalar quantity, which is basically the error. You can, so remember the error was YI minus xi w right so this is just the error for that one sample right or you can say the negative of error in terms of convention so so this is error and this is error times the value at that point right xi so if you put them into one equation what you would have is uh, you would get this term right where this xi transpose is nothing but stacking one and xi from this equation, because I can take the scalar out and then you can have this. So if I have to think of it in terms of matrices, right, to vectorize it, like if you want to use your library. So just convince yourself that this summation of this is basically this equation, where this x is now, uh, n, so this is for n dimensional, for, this is for all n data points. This was for only ith data point, right? So this is pure multiplication. This is also like multiplying this with this vector. This is a row vector. So if I do it like this, it 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 is the same effect for summing it up, right? Just don't get confused why xi transpose is on the right here and it comes at the front. Like, because you have to convince yourself that this is a scalar, but now in this case, this is not a scalar, right? This is n cross one, this is two cross n. 
So try out that maths, and after that, what you would realize is now th that becomes the gradient, and you can plug it in this equation, right? So I have eta one by n, and this is now my delta j w, right? Okay, so so that is the update step, uh, parameter update step for linear regression, where there are like uh. So, so in this case, this was just two. So this two was why because two was w was equal to w zero w one. Now you can see that this dimension of this entire thing is you can say it's two cross one, right? Now you can extrapolate it to uh, d variables. So if you have like d variables, right? You can do this one. You, I think you have uh, not d variable d parameters, right? D plus one parameters. So for d plus one parameters, you can have this step, right? So, so let's uh, try to put this in an algorithm, which is called as gradient descent algorithm. And this is called batch gradient descent, because as you can see here, in this term, you have to sum up over all the data points, right? All the end data points. So, uh, so what we do is at step equal to t equal to zero, we do a random w zero, right? To start off with in vanilla uh, gradient descent. So for t equal to zero till like for every iteration now, you compute your g, which is your del j, right? And it takes all the training samples for each iteration, right? So that means this effect of sigma one over n that is now here. So you have to do step three of where you calculate this gradient over all data points. Step four is our update step, right? Of W for the next iteration would be WT minus step size into GT. And we iterate it until it is time to stop, right? So we're going to go over step two, uh, two again, then compute step three. To compute step three delta del J, you have to plug in the WT from the previous iteration here. So let's write it down here, x transpose x w minus y, right? So this is known, x is known, y is known, w is now being updated from uh, every step, right? So in this new iteration, w would be the w from the previous iteration, right? So you, so your w is going from zero random to w1 to w2, and you keep doing that until you reach that sweet spot, right? And how do we know we reach that sweet spot? Well, there are like many factors, but one important thing you can think of it is your gradient starts changing less, right? Your del J needs to tend towards zero, right? Your whole idea was to have del J W converge to zero because you want the slope of the tangent to be zero at this bottom most point, right? So as you go, keep going and the values start becoming like very, very small, right? Then you know it's safe to stop because you're not going to all going to reach there eventually. So it is going to be very, very small, 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 small steps, right? And then, and that's why you that's why that notion of variable step size comes from. Because if you realize as you go closer to this point here, you don't want like if you are like here, right? So So you don't want to fluctuate a lot when you reach this point at the bottom, right? So that's why that's why that idea of variable step size came in where as you approach this sweet spot, you don't want to uh, change your W so much, right? But in this case, eta is taken as constant. So you might take a measure of, you maybe stop after a few iterations and see what the error is. And if your error is still big, you keep iterating it. Eventually, what would happen is as you increase your number of iterations, I think we discussed this last slide as well, your JW will eventually tend towards zero, right? Right. So whenever you feel fit that you need to stop iteration, you can stop that iteration somewhere or somewhere here. Right. So any questions on batch gradient descent? Now, one uh, aspect of gradient Another aspect of gradient descent is called as stochastic gradient descent, right? SGD. So there is, so we talk about batch gradient descent in tutorial, but there is an assignment question on SGD. So it's not a big difference. The, the major uh, demerit of batch gradient descent is this part. 
where you need to sum up all this uh, gradients from all these n data points, right? In that case. So even though you would be using some kind of vectorized code and you would think that it's an easy process, but again, to calculate that over n sample where n can be millions, billions and all that, it would take time. So step three would take time. That means for every iteration in batch gradient descent, you have to spend a considerable amount of time in step three to make sure you have effect of gradients from all data points. What stochastic gradient descent does is it does not wait for all the data points, gradients on all the data points to be calculated, right? So in, what it would do is, as you can see here, this was, okay, let me close. Right, this is the effect of gradient from one data point, right? So rather than summing it up over all data points, what I'm just going to say it uh, that W at T plus one would depend on W T minus eta. And then this and this gradient, let me call it that, call as G would be for a given sample, right? And then you're going to do this, update your step and in SGD, you would do it over sample from one to N. Right? So note that here W update in batch was after you calculate gradient from all, all, all the points in one go three, but in SGD, you don't have to wait for all the points. So it's like, so the idea here is to uh, fasten per iteration calculation, right? In this case, step three is taking a lot of time, but here your, your time to compute every iteration decreases, but yeah, your loops would increase because you, you would want to loop over all the N elements and update the W, right? So this, this step three to three and four, they they are from for sample one to n. So that means for every iteration or called as epoch, right? For every iteration or epoch, you want to compute the w after e for every sample, like like update after every sample calculation. Whereas here you wait for all that delta j over the entire sample to be computed and then do this update. So that's why SGD is faster. But what happens is if you have to plot this like this, while your gradient descent would be slow, right? Your gradient descent can be slow here. Batch gradient descent. But uh, so your uh, SGD would be quicker, but it would start oscillating around that optimal point, right? So that is that extra effect it has. And SGD might not lead you to the exact solution of gradient descent because you're not taking, because your update of W is not over all the data samples at every step. So uh, can I, let's let, can yeah, I please. Yeah, yeah, sure. So think, think of, uh, so these contours that you see, right? First of all, what is the x-axis? What is the y-axis? You should always have a clear picture of that. The x-axis is one of the weights, y-axis is another of the weights, right? So two weights. And what is coming out of this plane uh, in, in depth is the loss function, right? So that is the error squared or the, or uh, uh, whatever else it is like cross entropy or something. So we want to minimize that error, which is the center of the, the smallest blue contour. Now, uh, when, you, when you're looking at SGD, this set of curves is not going to be the same for every step. This set of curves is dependent on the data on which you are computing the gradient 
and the structure of the model. So which is in this case, let's say a linear model uh, and the error, of course, which is the mean square error. So because you change the, the samples in each iteration of SGD, your curves are going to be slightly shifted in each iteration. So what that does is it uh, it makes the updates noisy, but it when you don't have convex optimization, when the loss function is not convex, it also helps you escape local minima. Because what may be local minima for a set of five points, randomly chosen five points, may not be the local minima for another set of five points that you choose in the next iteration. Okay, so that's why SGD has a, several advantages over uh, batch gradient descent. Someone asked a question about curvature. Curvature just means how fast your derivative is changing, which basically- Smooth, you derivative. can think of it as how sharp this curvature is. Right. Okay, question. So this, yeah. Are there questions? Ramohan? Uh, yes, sir. sir. Like in the previous example, when we were doing normal batch uh, gradient descent, we were uh, guaranteed that it will reach the optimal solution given that the step size is adequate and we are performing good, good steps and moving towards in the negative direction of the tangent. So it we will reach a local minima. There's no guarantee it will reach a global minima if the loss surface is not convex. Yes, sir. In case of convex, we will reach the, the optimal solution. Right. Uh, so in is it also guaranteed for SGD? No, that's what uh, JD was saying, right? Because in 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 every iteration, you are choosing a random subset of points. Because you are choosing a random subset, each random subset has its own minima, which may not align with the minima of all points taken together. In but if you if you have one thousand cats and one thousand dogs, what is the minima for five cats and five dogs? And another set of five cats and five dogs could be very different from the minima for all thousand cats and thousand dogs taken together. Okay. So yes. that's why, but it is hopefully in the same neighborhood. That's why you will oscillate around the optimal point. So in practical application, both of us would, both the algorithms will lead to almost similar solutions. Yes. Almost similar. Okay. And another question, uh, sometimes training with SJD takes more time compared to mini batch. Why so? Uh, so mini batch. Uh, uh, oh, why? mini batch is different, right? Mini batch is you take small, small pockets. It's like in between of SJD, which is on one sample and batch, which is on the entire batch of N, right? Yeah. So you have yeah mini batch based SJD also. So what I was talking about five cats and five dogs, actually I was talking about mini batches. Uh, so uh, SGD is quite noisy because every time your sample, you choose a simple, single sample and it changes. So if you take batches, then you converge faster. So the idea of mini batches rather than going from one to N, like think of mini batch as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, in between batch and grade and uh, stochastic in stochastic uh, stochastic what happened was this delta gt was basically gi for every sample and it was for every all the n samples one after the other right but in mini batch what happened was this n is suppose let's say you have 100 points now rather than going from 1 to 100 you're going to take a random randomly chosen batch of 20 right so my mini batch size is 20 so i'm doing 1 to 20. now at every iteration that you go from here because your data samples like those 20 samples can be any random 20 samples right so after you have done this 1 to 20 you freeze that 20 samples for until you reach this step when you go for the next epoch right when t is equal to 1 now you don't have that guarantee that you're going to have that same 20 random samples because then you have to randomize the data set again, take a new random 20. So in that case, as so the effect of that, um, sto, uh, this stochastic gradient descent comes in because now for what is that minima for that 20 samples might not be the minima, which is for the next batch of 20 samples in the next epoch, right? So in that case, it might not mini batch might not 
lead you to the solution quickly because that surface plane is changing for all those 20 samples. Yeah, so uh, for mini batch, it would be faster, but there would be more updates happening, right? Because, it, because you can see for mini batch, there is hardly any uh, loop, right? Because what you have to do is compute this GI for one sample. That's why it's mini, uh, this one, uh, stochastic is also called as online update. You don't, and think of it as if you have like thousand or million samples in batch, you are stuck at that point three until you can calculate it over million samples because there's a sigma i over million. But for the stochastic, as soon as you get one gradient information from one data point, you just go and update this step four and you quickly move on to the next sample. So there is no waiting time. So your per iteration time is drastically reduced in this SGD, stochastic. Okay, so let's move on to- uh, Excuse me. Yes, yeah. I, I raised my hand quite, a, it's quite some time back. So, oh. Yeah, so I wanted to ask two questions. So mm -hmm. one of them is from quite a previous, from quite some previ a previous topic. And one of them just now about SGD first. So regarding SGD, uh, it might be faster, but it does not convince me that you'd end up at a good solution. Because you see the point that was taken up first time, will have a very small effect by the time you reach the end of the uh, batch. So it looks like this, this algorithm is giving more preference to the points that are taken up later on. So how does that let you end up anywhere close to the original solution? Suppose the outliers lie uh, towards the end of the uh, sample then, would it do good? So because, of, so see equation three and four would be computed for all the all the samples, right? It would be computed for all the samples. So no doubt the samples which are upfront might be impacting the W, but for every epoch, like if you see this epoch, right? That's where you would want to decide when to stop. For every epoch, all that N samples have given their effect on that W. So if you have to think of that, if you compare what the W update after batch gradient epoch and SGD epoch is, of course, that would be different because in batch gradient, your W was updated only once. Whereas in stochastic gradient descent, your W has been updated N number of times before you go for the next epoch. Yes. So I think on an, on, on an average, if you take everything and you go by epoch by epoch, that's why your SGT fluctuates a lot. It fluctuates, like it fluctuates a lot till it reaches that minima, right? But iterate, per, per iteration, it becomes quicker, right? Per iteration time becomes quicker. Okay. Even though there are small, small deviations happening, like randomness happening while moving towards that minima. That's right. why as you, as you go closer and closer to that point, right? As you go closer and closer to that uh, sweet spot, you would have these oscillations around that point, right? Okay. Whereas in, in, in SGD, right? But at least you are, you are reaching towards that point. It's always about tending towards that point, right? Yeah. So it's just a faster way of computing. And, and as Dr. Sethi said, this is an example of convex, right? So if you do not have a convex step, now if you're taking batch, batch is what? It would stop at here, whereas your True, a true goal was to reach here, right? Mm -hmm. For in that case, SGD can help escape this local minima because that loss surface changes as you see more and more points at a different stage. Mm -hmm. How can we know that we have taken larger learning rate just by looking number? So experiments, uh, well use, yeah, it's an experimental thing like hyperparameter tuning. So that's about tuning and playing with eta and seeing the effect. Does anyone know the TA? Oh, we can, we can plot the loss. And if it is uh, jumping around, then uh, if, if it goes down and then it jumps around later on, it means that your uh, learning rate is maybe too high. Like it's the effect of this, this one, right? So maybe sometime it was increasing, sometime decreasing, like they're fluctuating, is it? 
Yes. So it goes yeah. down for some time, and then later on it starts fluctuating. So you can do two things: either you reduce the learning rate from the very beginning, or you just ball ball parkically look at the iteration at which it starts jumping, and then you can reduce the learning rate after that iteration, so that it goes. On. Yeah. So in in between, also we can change. Huh? Yes. I mean, I I I try it sometimes. As in, I I don't I don't okay. know if it's good or not, but it works for me. Okay, okay. But then becomes an adaptive one because you're saying, oh, for these these many iterations, I have this step size of yes, this, so, and yes, like it's yes. like manual. Yes, yes. Adaptive. So I I ballpark it by looking at it. So like it's it's uh, going. Uh, I mean, I look at it and see see that maybe after the 200th iteration, rather than decreasing, it is then just uh, moving here and there. So it's just it's just vibrating up and down. So then I uh, reduce the learning rate by a factor of 10. So, yeah. yeah so actually i also tried but uh, before analyzing that the what is the learning rate exactly lot of computation has already gone nearly 100 like that no, so no. i i'm trying to decrease the computation no so don't start with an epoch which is too high right don't start with a very high epoch you just yeah so what is the range range of that learning rate i mean can you i i i usually go with 1e minus 2 as in 1 by 100 Okay, okay something around that and uh, like 0.1 0.01 it's like yes. that kind of thing. yes and then okay. once you plot the graph it becomes pretty clear what you have to do do you have to go up or go down okay. so just like a active to hyperparameter tuning which is a painful task for every ml practitioner yes. like you have to see the plots and see what is the best best set of hyperparameters okay okay And, and hence auto ml and everything came in later automate this process as well so uh, let's move on to uh, linear regression but now with regularization because we want the our idea is to do well on the unseen test samples so what we have to do is to avoid overfitting the training data and in a way avoid fitting that noisy sampled uh, data in your plot right and the goal is to generalize well on unseen test data and the idea here is to play defensively right in the idea is that we are not going to be very strict in terms of making sure that every test point is fitted because that is bad for unseen test samples so what we are trying to do here is we are going to bound the space of w right so you see as you can see w are parameters which is a d plus 1 vector right now w is free that means in that entire plane r2 your or r r d uh, your w can take any value where, where in every value can have can be any number from minus infinity to infinity right so what we the idea here is to cons put constraints on w so that you are fitting the model but at the same time you want to make sure that w is chosen from a constraint set rather than giving the giving it full space to choose from right and it is to make sure that you we choose that w so that we can generalize well so how we we do this in regression is let's start with like msc right so this was a form of msc we saw before a mean squared error right so there are now two techniques right so there is left and right so we have to minimize msc but now subject to some constraint in the left hand side what we are doing is we are trying to constrain the sum of absolute values or l1 norm of w which is less than equal to some constant c where c can be greater where c is greater than c right so it making sure that sum of absolute values of the parameters it's constrained so this is called as lasso regression in terms of uh, ml right or statistics on the right hand side we have a slightly different definition of what the bound on w is it is basically saying that your l2 norm right w transpose w is basically l2 norm like sum of squares of every element in that w that is less than equal to c right so l2 norm can again be thought of as like l2 square norm right so l2 square norm can be thought of as an effect of a circle right so we going to show that soon so now what we do is to solve an optimization problem where you have to minimize an objective function subject to constraint 
in optimization, what we generally do is it's true for any numerical optimization. You try to bring in constraints into the objective function so that you don't have constraints. So how do we do that is we take a kind of a parameter called as lambda, which is again a hyperparameter here, and that assigns a penalty, right? And I think we, we have already seen this in pr prior lectures of how th this lambda correlates to model complexity. So what you can think of here is that first of all, lambda is greater than zero, right? Lambda is positive. It's not equal. It has to be strictly greater than zero. There is question. In which situation? Okay, we'll talk about that. So if you see here the construct, if my lambda is exactly equal to zero, you have a non-regularized form, which is minimizing MSC, right? And if you and so so when when lambda is going towards zero, what we are trying to say here is we are relaxing the constraints on W. Because if lambda is equal to zero, there is no constraint on W. It is a free market now. W can be from anywhere in the space, right? So, so we want to be like slightly more than zero so that we regularize it. But I'm just trying to correlate it to a normal linear regression formula, right? So lambda tending to zero means you are relaxing constraints on W. So as you go closer to zero, your W would be very, very, very relaxed. Now, what it means is where you had initially decided to constrain your W, you are trying to make that constraint region grow. Because what is happening here is, let me probably show you this map so that it's easier for you to understand. Now, earlier I had this, this part, right? Here, W could have been anything in the 2D space. And eventually we'll land up at W hat which is the least square coefficient, which is the center of the ellipse. But now we have a kind of bound on what that W0, W1 can be, right? The parameter can, has to be from a bounded set. So in this case, if my lambda is tending towards zero, my constraint region is growing in a way that I'm converging to least le square estimate right, when there was no regularization at all. That means Lasso and Ridge gets thrown out and it, they all mean linear regression if you put your lambda tending to zero. That, and in a way you can say that you're trying to start now, try, you're trying to now overfit the data because your model complexity starts increasing, right? That means you're trying to do the least square estimate, which is the best possible estimate, but then it's not going to do well on unseen test points. So what we do is we do a kind of bound on what that W space is. So if you see the left side, this blue region is basically W is less than equal to C, the constraint. So that means the goal is still to optimize for a W on this level curves. But now your solution space would be something which lies in this region. This is the constraint region. That means it has to satisfy both the parts. While it is trying to decrease or go towards that center of that point, but it also has to satisfy the fact that it is within the constraint region. Now, see, this is the effect. So, so if my lambda is going to zero, I just want to show you the effect. If my lambda is tending to zero, my constraint space would start increasing. And you, as you can see, it is trying to allow a free liberty of W. And in that case, W would be going towards your W hat, right? But we don't want that. We want to regularize it. So that is the effect of lambda tending to zero. Similarly, on, on the right-hand side, what we have is we have this one, which is an equation of a circle, right? W01 square plus W1 square is less than or equal to C, right? Uh, so I might be a bit wrong here. It might be, I think, root C in this case, right? It would be root C. Yeah, you can take it C squared, doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So, 
so what we have here is now again your answer would be somewhere in this region including the circumference but at the same time it has to help in decreasing that going through this level curve but now after you have fixed your uh this part right you have fixed your lambda so this surface is for a fixed lambda lambda is fixed lambda is fixed now when you are trying to play with this lambda which is in this case this hyperparameter it de decides do you want to be very strict that means this one right or you want to allow it to be within this circle and if lambda is tending to zero that means it becomes this entire white plane this entire surface becomes your playing field and in that case your answer is actually the this answer so as you can see here to make sure that our w satisfies the constraints you will see we are not going to go to w hat not w lambda tending to zero w, did i mention w tending to zero no this that was lambda tending to zero this is all about if if i increase the size of this blue region right if i make this bigger bigger diamonds on this plane my lambda is tending to zero because what that would mean is this this part would be tending to zero so it would be just msc so lambda tending to zero means it is going back to original msc that can only happen if you allow this size of square or blue square or blue circle to grow so that eventually what would happen is you would have this one and at this at this lambda your actual w hat which is from your let's say w hat is from least square estimate it would be same as w range right but then let's we want to regularize it in a way that we don't allow that much huge so you can see it's all about magnitude of w right so this space was all about magnitude of w because that circle is talking about what is that magnitude of w because it's event eventually being uh, it's all about w1 square plus w2 square right it's about what is that magnitude of w you can want to take so you don't want to take large magnitudes of w you are trying to constrain it right are there any questions before i talk about the intuition and the effect of these things? yes uh, there are questions let's start with the youtube questions one question mm -hmm. is how can we say that large w leads to overfitting and small w not well in this case from this plot you can see that if you go to w hat w hat is the true w hat you want to reach is the best fit but if you do w hat you are overfitting the data right because if you if you eventually reach this point which your goal so far was you're going to fit the data which is a training samples and you have not taken into account that this model has to be deployed on unseen test samples so in a way you're also trying to model the noise which was there in the training samples so the goal is not to be fitting it too perfectly yes so in in other words uh, any time you are constraining uh, constraining w so that it doesn't have a free hand on just fitting on the training data then its uh, validation performance is more predictable it's closer to the training performance uh second question is it possible that in case of local minima minima gradient descent will give local minima yes totally possible and in fact that's exactly what gradient descent does it does not find global minima it finds local minima but if it is a small enough local minima then it's possible that you have your step size was too large and you will just bypass that local minima and land on the other side of the of the ridge okay uh, let's take some more questions there are some from the chat and then we'll come to the people who have raised their hands sometimes sgd takes more time compared to mini batch specifically in keras one epoch sgd takes more time than batches but epoch should be faster because they take only one sample so epoch means once you have gone through all the samples at least once it does not mean one iteration so in typically an epoch contains 
if you have n data points it will have updates based on all n points whether you take them all in one go or in mini batches or one at a time in a random order so epoch means epoch means the same thing for for all different techniques so that's why in scd it can take longer uh you want to add anything uh, jd no i think it's 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 good like uh, the epoch basically is like you have to go over the entire training samples within that it can be another for loop where in sgd you are doing that n number of times but your epoch is the most outermost loop if you have to think it think of it like that uh how can we know we have taken larger learning rate by looking at numbers how can we take it is it by oh, many I experiments we, or some intuition we covered it yeah yeah we all i think we have to take uh from this on lasso onwards abhi lasso on okay okay uh, in which situation should lasso be used and in which situation ridge should be used and why are we averaging in ridge and not doing so in lasso i think we are averaging Aver in right? averaging averaging what oh this averaging lambda by 2 and n ridge is just for what will happen at the later i want to cancel out the effect of n at the later when i solve it yeah that, that you can take lambda by n as lambda hat for ridge it's just yeah. something like yeah it's for convenience of uh, But, taking a derivative right yeah. and then divide by 2 is basically because there's a square when you take the derivative that 2 is going to come down and cancel with 1 by 2 uh, so yeah. it's just a mathematical convenience nothing else can you explain w tending to 0 for lasso part again lasso co uh, coefficient 0 i mean number of uh, uh, i mean because of the rhombus shape so for any whenever you have lamb oh you mean coefficient equal to 0 okay so uh, so think of it this way When, i think i will talk about it uh, that what is the intuition and what are, what are the sparsity i will talk about that that's why i have okay. hidden so that this tangent and all that we'll talk later ha huh? okay yes why adding the norms to error function restricts the sum and the square of the sum of the parameters so look at the error function again it's a sum of two different loss functions one is msc the other is l1 norm or the l2 norm of the weights both of which are convex functions now lambda does a uh, trade off between msc and the regularization term which is l1 norm or the l2 norm of w now if lambda equal to 0 that means the second term is doesn't matter only msc matters so you find the minimum msc that means you overfit on the training data msc is always on the training data okay now if you make on the other hand lambda is equal to positive infinity uh, lambda will be always non negative if you make it positive infinity it's in a sense saying that the msc has a zero coefficient so msc does not matter you will choose w in such a way that it satisfies uh, minimization of l1 norm of w or or l2 norm of w in both cases it is at the origin of w which is like w equal to 0 w1 equal to 0 w2 equal to 0 w3 that means that means you are not doing anything because your training data you have actually discarded away with lambda equal to infinity yeah. so that you means your not, data points do not have any effect exactly. which is bad right in ml you are trying to get some insights from data points but then you're saying msc is now very low because lambda is infinite okay so now uh, yes followed by ram mohan go ahead i wanted to know so in the case of lasso in the figure we are given a rom rhombus so right now so initially we were we were trying to find this w hat but now we can only constrain ourselves in this rhombus glory so trying mm -hmm. to what are we trying to achieve now because we are not given the cost function in that region so what does that no 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 okay wait a minute you're just seeing a partial answer here see th these are not just three lines right these are the lines so your jo your journey is still from outermost to innermost but within this rhombus only you can only choose w from this set that means i'm asking you to go from outer to innermost levels but then whatever parameter you choose it has to only belong to this shaded part which is the blue now it's black shape colored okay. now yes. see you're not allowed now you, now you're not allowed to take any w so that you can go from here and there right you have to only choose your w from within this region remember this is this plot of w2 versus w1 
this 2d level this level curves are also on the same coordinate w1 cross w2 right in that same plane so so your selection is only within this black rhombus now earlier it, it was the entire w1 cross w2 space you could have chosen any any w1 comma w2 okay so 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 what i'm trying to say is let's say that uh, w hat is really far away like let's say 100 comma 100 something and we choose c as 5 uh, c length as 5 then the cost function in the region of this rhombus would would be the difference would be far too much for our model to do anything good this is what i'm trying to understand yes so that means you over regularized so there is over regularization and under regularization and under regularization your lambda is too big or too small how will you choose lambda good value of lambda ramohan yes sir or yash who was who was asking yes sir i was asking yes, uh, so how will you uh, how will you choose a good value of lambda based uh, on based on where w hat is no based on validation no, no. based on validation it's a hyperparameter yeah just like step size so whichever yeah, lambda, lambda it, is lambda uh, yeah whichever lambda value okay try different lambdas lambda equal to 0 means no regularization lambda is equal to 0.001 0.01 0.1 1 10 100 etc the one that gives you best performance on validation data that was the right lambda okay sir so one more question hmm. so in the in the step where uh, the definition of leg, uh, lasso reg, uh, regularization is given can you please go to that one just above this just above this so i'm trying to understand how multiplying the norm of w with lambda is constraining w to be within like within the value of c oh lambda is dependent on c so in this case if this is subject to this term right if it is subject to this term now in optimization we take this inside like this right and now now, now that lambda and c are kind of so c in this case in this equation if there was some technique to solve this right where you would not have to take it within the optimization then the c is the hyperparameter but when you take it as a one optimization form now lambda has that effect of c inside it so doing working on lambda is basically affecting that region c which if in a way is affecting this plot right so you can see that if lambda is equal to 0 c is infinity yes sir if that is a relationship you wanted to ask so lambda for, equal to 0 infinity for lambda equal to 0 i understand but i'm trying to understand let's say c is any value and i'm trying to make like constrain my w in 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 a certain range then how does how does multiplying w norm with lambda um, and finding then finding the minimum minimum w for this cost function uh, like limit the value of w for me like how is that mathematically sound no it also depends on relatively what is the curvature of the msc contours at that point right it, you cannot see it in isolation so c and lambda have that relation which is based on also based on the other part which is the msc of w in general it's a conceptual thing to worry about c but we don't worry about c we just play with lambda the one that gives you best validation performance so lambda is like a trade off it's a trade off a uh, trade off or a penalty right so in this case do you want to if lambda is equal to 0 that means everything is in favor of msc now but if you choose some lambda then you're trying to bring in small aspect of constraints into this equation so lambda is just take it as some parameter which says do you want to constrain your magnitude of w or not if you say no then you are just doing msc which is over which will exactly fit but if you say oh let's let's add some kind of constraint on w let 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 it not grow to infinity let it not take a free space in this entire plot let it be just within this rhombus right then we just say oh lambda is non zero now so lambda is like 0.1 0.01 that means there is some effect of this constraint space yes sir yes sir 
So your so your domain becomes this constraint region. The, the choice of Ws that you want to take, W1 and W2, are only restricted to this blue rhombus or a blue circle. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. good. Thank you. Yash. Yeah. So I won't take much time because already we have taken so much time. So I have I have a question regarding uh, how uh, regarding the method of the the original method of uh, optimization that we use uh, that uh, we we use the gradient and then op, uh, update our values so if we have a gradient l1 uh, so uh, uh, we have the first derivative then we are using the taylor expression up until only the first term right uh, I, i didn't get the so what i am trying to say is if you if you try to expand the value of a function at a point you can write a taylor series right mm -hmm. and then the first term of that taylor series is what we yes, are trying yes, to do yes yes exactly yes. so that will yes. give us a line right along which we move the tangent right mm uh -huh. so that so and we have to choose the step size also which is which is kind of a difficult thing to do at, uh -huh. at the learning rate so why don't we take two uh terms take the first derivative and the second derivative and then take that part and that would give you a quadratic curvature which would have a definite uh, minima right so you can jump to the minima and then uh, update your step according to that wouldn't that be faster did you did you get what i asked you're saying add another term of the taylor series which is the del square yes so uh, i mean i have a figure but uh, i mean i can't show it so what i'm trying to say is uh, uh, can i share the screen for a sec i have to go ahead so uh, is it visible i mean mm -hmm. so this is the figure where the black line is the let's say the loss uh, uh, the curve right the red line gives you the gradient descent that we use and the blue parabola would give you what i am trying to say so the green part that i have uh, marked should be the minima so you directly jump from that point to this point and then you do it again over here over here there might be some other curve which works something like this and then you again draw the parabola so wouldn't that be faster because you are directly jumping from one point to the minimum of the parabola which should probably be we should uh, be some better point why wh is it computationally expensive to calculate the second derivative is that why we not use it or is it not good theoretically as well well the second derivative is the hessian right one yes. computationally would be expensive to calculate and for all for practical purposes i think uh in this case jumping right you are taking a big jump you are like it's basically saying you are flying across this part rather than taking rolling down the slope you are just jumping right yes yes so but but it would probably be a better point right because if it's not a better point then the minima would be there only the parabola would end right there right because if it would if, if it would have been this point then the parabola would have been like this only so it would not have gone anywhere so i think it should work but i don't know how to i mean uh, just vectorizing the process of finding the second derivative itself does not seem very viable to me which is why i have never tried this method but i mean we'll probably try it out in the assignments and let us know like it. yeah okay so uh, just a second Okay. For the remaining questions on chat, this will where will you where will you? Why the name? Ridge, uh, which part was it? Uh, oh, we'll talk about. So yeah. you will see the effect of ridge when I show you the equation. Ridge basically means there is something. you will see one i show you the formula lasso is basically an acronym it basically means least absolute shrinkage there's something there's a full form of lasso which it means this this google it i think least absolute shrinkage operator double s 
I Sink might have missed one. Ah, shrinkage and selection operator because it yeah, selects shrinkage. variables. Yeah. Yeah. So now let's let's talk about that. What's the fun part of all this? Now see the last row, right? Now you want to find out the W on that blue blue rhombus, and it can be anywhere. It can be on the boundaries of that rhombus or inside that rhombus. But at the same time, it has to choose a value which is which has a less j. So in this case, let's say let's say you are starting let, let's say you are starting from this uh, this w right. So, so you are starting from this right. And as you are growing this size right, what would happen is that this point the only the only regions in this rhombus where you would hit this level curve and it would have a small values only at these four four corners you can see that like suppose i draw this one right which is the outer level curve now in this case you can see that oh i need to be within this blue region so i can so if you take any of these points which are here on this curve they have the same same effect of j right but you can always argue that you can always go to a level down to this this curve where you are just touching this rhombus it is still satisfying the constraint equation and for, for and compared to this this has a lower jw right so you can always look into these lower contours until you reach that spot where you are just touching only the corners of this so in last so what we what happens is the only probable solutions are these four corners they are the only solutions and if you see if they are the only solutions one of the other parameters vanishes because the coordinate of this point is 0 comma w2 this is w1 comma 0 right in this case it is 0, 0 comma minus w2 right and in this case it is basically c and plus c right so all those things are there so this is uh minus w1 comma zero so you can see that if now our solution is only going to be these four points the other parameter vanishes so basically lasso gives an effect of zero parameters like some of the parameters can go to zero which basically means you're doing a kind of a feature selection because if your w is zero now recall this equation right w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x x1 x2 plus w d x d right so this is for a single sample which is y for that i is w x i x i2 x i d right now if some of these w1 w2 go to zero right that means basically you are basically saying that corresponding feature that corresponding x i k right that means i th sample k th feature is not important so this in a way you saying if your data set cross n cross d right some of those d features will not have any effect on output y because their coefficient w's are zero from the last one right so that's why it's called as uh, a feature selection technique and this induces sparsity in your w that means you can your w vector that you would learn d cross one it would be a sparse because there are some of the elements would go to zero this is just not 2d plane now think of it as a multi-dimensional plane so you can think of it as if you have a bed and you have all these knives pointing out so you have these sharp knives pointing out from a bed right and now if you take that thing and if you take this as a balloon right if you take this as a balloon then even before reaching the inner inside of that region these knives which are sticking out at all the corners right so they are going to touch the balloon first so wherever they touch that is the solution which satisfies both msc and still is within that constraint region right and if you go to this ridge now instead of knives suppose you have another balloon a smaller balloon with you right and now what you can do you can th think of it is you have to be within this ball or balloon and then wherever they, these points meet so these points so if you have this surface right which is the outer surface which is higher jw now 
all these zigzag lines are at the probable w1 comma w2 but they have the same error value right but then you can always argue that there is there will be at least one level curve because see this is infinite right even though i'm showing you four and five circles but because it's a continuous surface there are like infinite level curves so basically you have to pick up that point which is on a level curve which will always be on a level curve within this region but it's also is on the ball right so in this case you can see that this gives an effect of shrinking the uh, parameters because see here this w star had some w2 comma w1 right this was the original goal but now see what the solution of your ridge is this is this one so in this case w1 and w2 have a smaller values compared to what your original w1 w2 have been and that gives you an effect of shrinkage right so your parameter has shrunk but then you are within that constraint and on validation you would do much better than strictly following this w hat right and it it gives an effect of like reducing the model complexity because you are regularizing your model right so this is like overfitting if you go to the middle part so that's the idea so if if it helps you think of ridge as the balloon and lasso as all these knives pointing out and wherever you touch that's why lasso the only solutions can be the four corners it can't even be on this line segment yeah, actually uh, uh, i I'll, i'll take that back it can be on the line segment depends on what the value of lambda so so okay. let me put it this way uh, uh first of all uh, what you are trying to see is you are trying to minimize uh, msc which is uh, which is characterized by these concentric uh, ellipses and uh, and l2 norm or l1 norm like lambda times l2 norm or l1 norm so uh, your solution is always going to be on one level curve of the msc surfaces and one level curve of either these circles or the rhombuses okay so let's take the circles example so l2 now so it will always or shall i take over shall i yeah yeah go ahead or oh, you want me to stop the recording hello hello can i do my screen share oh okay the screen share part yeah okay. just give me a uh, stop yeah uh where did it go okay uh, share screen share screen okay can you see it Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me put it this way, right? So you have you have these curves. These are the curves of MSC. This is the lowest MSC point, okay? And these are away from the origin somewhere. And then you have these circles. These each circle is for a different lambda value for uh, L two norm. Now the point the the solution will always be on some tangent of these two curves. It will be on the where they touch each other tangentially it cannot be on a point where where they it cannot be on a point where it is not tangent these so let me put it this way let me change the color these two cannot be the solution the only solution that can be there is the one that is uh, that i have shown earlier i'll just circle it with a red point only this can be a solution so it always has to be on the tangent of the concentric circles coming from the origin and the concentric ellipses coming from the minimum msc point okay so if this was your unconstrained solution then increasing lambda will sh shrink w1 and w2 and bring it closer to the origin along this path what is this path on this path some ellipse and some circle are tangent Okay, so this is your infinite lambda. This is your zero lambda point. So why these two have to be tangential 
is because if you look at a non tangential point like this one uh, you can always minimize for the same set of msc and same so on these contours uh, the w1 w2 l2 norm is same or the msc is the same so you can always move to a lower msc point by tracing the same curve and go to the tangential point so it will always be on the tangent point now you take the example of L, uh, l1 now so here your different l1 norms will give you different rhombuses so now if you have concentric circles of msc like this there can be tangential points here but for larger ones it will the tangential point will be at the corner for for uh, smaller ones it will be here but for the larger ones it will be at some corner and that's when you get elimination of variable so for small lambdas you don't get elimination of variable for example for lambda 0 you might even just get this so here your trajectory is something something like uh, it will be like this and then it will go like this let me draw it in a different color so that means you can choose your lambda in such a way that your rhombus shape becomes smaller so that it just touches the vertex yeah so whenever it is on this section of the trajectory where uh, locus where it is like along the axis that's when you eliminate the other variable but then for small lambdas you may not actually be on the on on this okay so yeah so that so that's the hyperparameter right so if you as a practitioner wants to want to have the effect of like zeroing out one of the parameters then you have to choose your lambda to be slightly larger and larger until you get that effect of vanishing one of the parameters that's right yeah okay any any questions so far do we have any questions from youtube or okay prithik no you had a question yeah no questions yes. on youtube hello sir mm -hmm. uh, so i want to ask uh, basically uh in uh, uh, uh sorry uh in the uh, ridge uh, regression uh, what we do like add the penalty function in the msc so how does this uh, overcome uh, the overfitting part like uh, we uh, try to reduce the msc plus penalty function that is lambda into slope square uh, so, so see your w now your w from ridge or lasso would be this point or in this example this point right and that's where you would say that now fit the model using this w lasso and you can see that this w lasso will have some kind of training error because here if you had gone to if you had made the journey to the center you would have exactly fitted the training data right but now you have stopped here you have stopped at w ridge you are no longer going to w star or w hat in this case so in a way you are your training error might not be exactly zero but your validation error would be much better because it's an unseen test samples does that answer your question yeah, yeah. like basically this is the point know? this is the point of lambda equal to zero okay okay got it thanks because it will be only msc then that means the least square solution this is the least square solution okay thanks sure uh, rahul is it that we get the solution for top vertex rhombus in last so well as dr sethi said uh, in this example the small example that you have it would be the top solution but it can be that if your level curves are differently oriented it might not be that case but as a practitioner if you want to do feature selection right then you have to increase your this is lambda equal to 0 and as you move here your lambda is increasing right so in this case you you would want to choose your lambda in a way that you take a smaller rhombus where it just hits the vertex because that's what was shown right 
your journey is this. Can you give an example when solution will be there at other vertices of rhombus? Okay, so this was the top axis, right? So if you rotate this image or you can think of it like this. It, so this is because the level curves are like this, right? If your objective function MSC was something like this, then this one has a chance. And this is just a 2D plane. So imagine like there are like multiple knives in a multi-dimensional plane. So you, you don't know where you can hit, but wherever you hit, you know, because this W1, W2, W3 are basically your axes, right? These are your axes. So if anywhere it is on this axis, other parameters would go down to zero. Okay, great. So let's move on if there are no more Hrithik, you asked your query, right? Or have you not? If have, if you have, just lower your hand. Okay, great. So now solving this ridge regression, right? So just quickly, just see what the effect is. So I'm solving the ridge regression in this case, right? You can look at lasso um, because it has a different form, but this is the parameter, lambda by 2n, right? You will understand why there is a 2, why there is an n at the bottom. It's not averaging, but it's just for numerical convenience. So if you see, if you take a derivative of all these things, you will end up having this equation, right? The left-hand side is from the usual mean square error, right? And this right-hand side is coming from this rigid expression, right? And that's where this two and two got canceled. You have lambda by n, right? So, so now if you take this gradient, right, dj, uh, dj by dw, right? This is a gradient formation. and what you have to do is you have to put this gradient equal to zero at some W star, right? Just like our usual way of doing it when we wanted to make it equal to zero. So now what would happen is you would get some W star, which is of this, X, this, this, this form, right? Now you can see that there is this extra term which pops up. This is basically called as ridge. Right? This is called the ridge. Earlier it was x transpose x whole inverse x transpose y. There was no lambda. If lambda equal to zero, this would be just like least square fitting. So that is called as ridge. Right? So so now, now the effect of this ridge is it makes, so earlier remember what the issue was that we were never convinced that x transpose x inverse might be invertible because of the fact that it can have a kind of multicollinearity or it can be uh, difficult to do so because of its numerical instability. So, and there was always this chance of X transpose X being a singular matrix. What it means is determinant is equal to zero, right? Now having this positive Lambda, remember that Lambda was strictly positive. So it adds a kind of a constant term to this matrix. So basically whatever your X transpose X a correlation matrix was you add this lamp uh, this matrix yeah you add, you add this matrix into this one and now what has happened is your eigenvalues where your eigenvalues of x transpose x could have been greater than or equal to zero now your eigenvalues are strictly positive what it means is the inverse always exists so here you don't have to worry about what would be x transpose x because in rich it takes into account all these different variations of X, but because the bracket term, it's strictly uh, a positive definite matrix, right? So it's inverse would exist in this case. It is invertible and you can solve this equation, right? You can again solve this using gradient distant, that is still fine, but I just wanted to show you the difference of analytical solution in both the cases, regularization and without regularization. So that's lambda is the extra term. Okay. So, so try out these derivations yourself. Now let's move on. Are there any questions, quick questions on this? Of, there was a question of why it's called a ridge because of this ridge term. There's some kind of lambda i constant which is added. 
okay so in logistic regression uh, the idea here is to learn a probability measure right so it's the same task but then you can use this probability to do kind of classification so pretty quickly you have an x you want to ma map a function to y where y can be now discrete space instead of y being a real y can be a discrete space which is between 0 and 1 which is basically probability measure it can also be thought of as based on the probability you want to further take this and make it as minus 1 comma 1 or 0 comma 1 as like class 1 or class 2 so once you have the probability you can estimate how can this be used as a classifier right for example you have to pred predict the likelihood of heart attack for a patient given their health record right so what we do is again we try to say that it's a linear kind of a linear model why because it's a linear combination of features so here what i'm doing is i have features from k equal to 0 to d i want to estimate this f right and uh, so that relation is given by some function theta right so let's keep it as a generic theta so in previous case this theta was basically uh uh the mean squared error right but in this case it would be slightly different i've also changed the notation of x i've now taken it as a column vector so you would see a w transpose occurring now earlier x was a column a row vector so there was no transpose needed but in this case just i'm for classification i'm using this x as a column vector like every sample x is a column vector so it's w transpose x basically it's a scalar quantity inside that function so in logistic regression this function theta is basically a sigmoid or a logistic function the graph of that is if you have a a parameter s for this theta right so on this x axis is s so the values is between 0 to 1 where inflection point is at point 5 like that means when s is equal to 0 the value is point 5 and the function is given as a sigmoid which is e raised to power s divided by 1 plus e s which is simply 1 by 1 plus e minus s you can put s equal to 0 it would be 1 by 2 which is 0.5 and if s is equal to infinity positive infinity you can see that e raised to power minus s would tend to 0 so 1 upon 10 to 1 upon 1 would be 1 so it's tending to 1 right if s was negative infinity you would see that it's going to tend towards 0 right some of the properties of the sigmoid is if you take s as minus s you would eventually have 1 minus theta s if you take the derivative of this theta s sigmoid function you would have the same function multiplied by 1 minus theta s so those are some of the nice properties of sigmoid in terms of derivation because you can see that while we are doing gradient descent and all those things we need gradient right so that gradient would involve calculating derivative of this function as well so now uh, any any questions so far on this okay no so now given this data set of x i comma y i right where x i is a patient high is health information right now what we have to do is we want to learn these prob we have to find these f right estimate this f now what is that definition of f the function the map it's basically saying we want to learn some kind of a probability measure that you belong to so you are likely to have a heart attack right so did they have a heart attack or not in this case let's say one means they have a heart attack zero means they don't right so probability that person has a heart attack given their record and parameter w is defined as this map right and probability that they do not have a heart attack or it belongs to class y equal to 0 given the patient record and the parameter w of the model it is 1 minus f right so this is for a binary classification because there are only two categories right so for it for me it's for us it is easier to write it write it as 1 minus f right now if you have to combine these two equations into one equation to bring in the overall effect this is what it is right now to understand it what it basically means that plug in y equal to 0 if you plug in y equal to 0 you would have this form that means 
probability of y equal to zero given x and w is now y equal to zero means this term would be one and this term would be one minus f x, which is this term. If your y is equal to one, this would be one. Now this would be zero, and this would be just f x, which is this term. So this is just combining both these equations into one. Now let's assume that all these training examples are independently generated. That basically means a a person's one a person one's record does not influence person two's record, which generally is the case in our uh, day to day examples, right? Mostly. So what we're trying to now do is we're trying to estimate these probabilities, which is not directly computable, right? Because we don't know this f uh, in a way. And it's like a probabilistic measure. So what we do is we try for for all the samples. What we have to do is we are trying to learn a likelihood estimation that, given the data set X. Now this capital X is the entire data set. If you have been given that entire data set X and your parameter W, what is the probability of your patient records falling into either of the classes, right? Probability of Y basically means probability that they had a heart attack. So you're basically estimating or modeling what is the probability of getting a heart attack for each of these patients if you have all of their records and the model parameter W. Well, since these were taken as uh, independent uh, training examples, you can write this as product of individual probabilities for every patient. For every patient I want to n, this probability is basically product of probabilities of each of those stuff because those are, those are conditionally independent of each other. So you can just separate these out as product. Now, you can plug in what this P was from this equation, right, for one, one patient, and that is fx raised to power yi, one minus fx raised to power y, one minus yi, right? Now, the entire goal is to maximize this likelihood, right? So this is the optimization problem where you want to maximize the likelihood of predicting if, the, if, it, if, it, has a, uh, if it has a heart attack or not, right? So you have to maximize this likelihood. So now to be able to maximize this, this is all in a pro form of products, right? And it's difficult and not uh, advisable to use in this form. So we transform it into something called as log likelihood. Why? Because log is an increasing function. Log is an increasing function. So maximizing LW is same as maximizing log likelihood. And why do we need log? So that log we can use this property log of AB is same as log A plus log B. So basically we're converting this product of probabilities into sum of log likelihoods, right? So LW now, my small LW is basically my objective function, which is log of actual likelihood. So now you can now re replace this product by summation over one to N. And if you take this log over this FX raised to power Y one minus FX raised to power one minus Y and use this property log AB is log A plus log B, you will eventually get this form, right? So this form is like maximizing this, right? So, so far we have been minimizing a loss function, but in this case, we are maximizing the likelihood, right? Now, another form to think of it as you can minimize the negative of this function, right? Maximizing this function is same as minimizing the negative of this function. Well, that is something called as cross entropy loss. Right. So, so in uh, in in your uh, deep learning and all those models, when you learn about all those things, they would something of cross entropy loss, right? So it's basically in classification that is what you have. You're maximizing the likelihood, but you're minimizing the negative of that likelihood, which is basically the cross entropy loss. So here there are only two classes, hence you have two terms. If it is multi-class, then you can't do y i and one minus y i. Then you have to do y some y star, z star, where some of these coefficients should add up to one. Similarly, this fx and one minus fx won't be there. It would be like f1x, f2x, so that some of all these f1, f2 is one. Since there are only binary classes, I can write it in this form, right? And then now this becomes my optimization form and you can optimize it using gradient 
so in this case because it's a maximum like maximum uh, maximizing the lock likelihood so this is called as max gradient ascent not the descent but if you have to use gradient descent use this form negative of this likelihood hence you would see that i am using a plus sign because i want to do i want to climb the level surfaces which is again convex in this case right so maximizing a function is same as minimizing a negative of that so now i'm doing gradient ascent right so if we if i take so if i take only one training sample this is what my derivative would be so here i'm taking one training sample and one w out of my d parameters of w i'm just taking wk where k is going from 1 to d plus 1 right so if i take that derivative of this function if i take the derivative of this function then we would use those properties that we discussed that first of all our function f right xi right in this case it's a function of xi it's basically the linear combination of all those features of x so that's w transpose x here, right and then the derivative of theta dash s is theta s into 1 minus theta s so using these two properties if you derive it you will eventually end up here and this should not be surprising because we have seen this before we have seen this when we did the linear regression remember when we stacked it up as some constant into 1 and constant into xi that's what it is this is the error again this is the error in prediction times the training sample. The, the ith training sample, ith patient feature k. So this is what our gradient is with respect to this one feature k and for one sample, right? So this is for ith record and kth feature. So if you, if you, if, 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 if you see here, what we have done here is uh, WKT plus one is WKT. Now this is for only the kth sample, right? For the kth sample and for the ith record, right? So like that, you can just put multiple WK equations one below the other, and it will be a vectorized update for all these model parameters. So this is, this small example can again be thought of a stochastic gradient ascent why because you're taking one parameter at a time right so if, if 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 you see what my fx is in this case so this is this standard form that keeps coming up where this definition of fx changes now the definition of fx is it's a logistic function which is one by one plus e minus w transpose x right so that's what we have to take as an update rule any question so far? One one question is: uh, Isn't likelihood function here same as the posterior function we learned in uh, Bayesian vector? Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a data. likelihood. That you... Yeah, so it's basically the data likelihood, uh, but without assuming the term of the class conditional density. Yes, Kasina, it's the same formula that comes up again, y minus fx. This f is changing because in logistic, we want to estimate probability. So rather than having real outputs in regression, we want the outputs between zero to one. That's why this f is a logistic function or a sigmoid function, right? So that's what it is. Yeah, but instead of MSC, it's a cross entropy. Cross entropy. And also, if you are wondering why didn't we go for an analytical solution, see where this W transpose X is sitting. It is sitting at the power of E. So it's not possible to have a kind of an easy way of finding analytical solution. Whereas in terms of regression, instead of this entire one by term, we simply had W transpose X. Okay, so let's, I think, are there any hands up? Okay. So let's quickly introduce 
so so based on these probabilities you can then decide okay do you want to assign to one class for other class right so now we can talk about a pure classification model such as like uh now you are what you're doing is you're trying to estimate this function from x to y but this y is now binary class so it's no longer a probability it's no longer a real value it is 0 1 or minus 1 comma 1 it's like one class and other class right so you are trying to assign it as binary values so again you have to learn a model theta f which depends on a linear combination of the, of those features w transpose x right so so the idea here is that the la line you are going to learn right w transpose x this red line now as you Assume that W transpose X already has the effect of that slow intercept, right? So in this case, this line is W transpose X is equal to zero. That means as long as, and if you put any, any data sample into this equation, W transpose X, right? If you, if you put anything in W transpose X in this line, now this acts as a separating line or separating line in this case, because there are like X1 comma X2, right? This is a 2D plane, feature X1, feature X2. So if you plug in any X, and if it happens to be on the right-hand side of this plot, then W transpose X is positive for those cases, right? And if it happens to be on the left-hand side of this line, then all of these points would have the same sign, which is either W transpose X is positive or W transpose X is negative, right? That means all these points, if it is perfectly classifiable, right? So in this case, you have this line and you have crop plus, right? So all these points on the left-hand side share the same sign, which is negative. On the right-hand side, they share the same sign, which is positive. So that's what we want to say that based on W transpose X, we want to make a decision. If it is greater than zero, we will assign positive. If it's negative, less than zero, we'll make it as cl class zero or class minus one, right, right? So again, your decision boundary is linear because you're doing it on W transpose X. So, Perceptron model can be thought of as the first inspiration of how the how to model a human brain, and it is simple if you are, if you know about neural networks and everything. It's just one neuron, basically it's like one neuron, and so far it's just a fancy way of showing it so that you can relate it with related with neural networks later. But so far we have seen this W transpose X like this from lecture one onwards. Right, from linear regression, logistic regression, your first job is to calculate this W transpose X, right? So you can think of this, you have like a, a data sample X with D plus one features, X zero to XD. And then every feature, there is a weight associated with it, W zero to WD. So you're doing a summation, which is basically doing W transpose X, weighted, weight, weighted sum of all these features. And then there is this theta S. In regression, this theta s was basically uh, y equal to x because then w transpose x was same as w transpose x. Then in then we had one upon one plus e raised to power minus w transpose x for logistic. Now in this case, we can think of it as a step function theta. If you are on the if you are zero or positive, if the value of W transpose X is zero or positive, let's say we are assigning it to positive class, right? Probably it might also make sense to have, so I'm just giving you a definition of what step function is in this case. So it's in step function is defined as if S is greater than or equal to zero, right? It's one, if it is less than zero, it is zero, right? So, as I told you, it's inspired from how the human brain works. So again, going by the definitions of so far, now I can quickly write the formula directly. I don't have to think about deriving it, but if you want to, you can go ahead and find derivative. Just be careful about the point S equal to zero. The derivative would lie on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of it. At S equal to zero, it's not differentiable, right? But at a small neighborhood around S, there is a kind of differentiation. So if you took the, take that into effect, what you would have is again this form, where again, this is the error term that we have seen so far. It's always the same error and then XIK, the data sample, 
contribution from the data sample. So it's basically saying error and its value, the value of that data point. Now that f is a kind of this function that you choose. In this case, if you're choosing a step function, this f is a step function, right? So, so in this case, now what, what we have here is, let's see what happens, right? Now y minus fx basically is yi is the true class, it's the it's it's the class true ground truth from the data set and this is estimated that means it can be either zero or one now suppose your true class was positive but you do a mistake while prediction so you're going to predict it as zero so this is plus one but you predict it as zero so this is a misclassified point right? It's wrongly classified. So that's your error, right? So error is one minus zero. That means your sample is directly multiplied by the step size. So if you do a mistake on a, po on a positive example, then your weight update is simply eta times xi. Right? But if you, if let's say if you had a true negative, if you had this class two, which is zero, right? If you had a class two, and if you had wrongly estimated it as to belonging to one class one, then you again did a error in classification, right? So in this case, it is zero minus one, right? So in this case, zero minus one is minus. So in a way, what you're trying to do here is if you do a mistake on negative sample, right? If you're doing a negative uh, mistake on uh, mistake on zero zero example, then you're trying to subtract this term, the contribution of that data point. So, so that's why perceptron is called as an online model because for every data sample, now you don't to update this W, you don't need to have the entire data set all at once. You can slowly, you, you can start with, you can start with one training sample and try to update your classifier line based on the impact of that one sample. If you misclassify on a zero example, zero class problem, then you are decreasing your W. If you're doing, uh, if you're doing, mis doing misclassification on positive class, then you are increasing your W, right? So that is the effect that they have. So this function that you see here can have either of those two updates. It can either decrease W or increase W based on how you're doing misclassification. Dr. Said, do you have anything to add on this apart from this discussion, if any insight you have? Uh, no, I think it's well explained. Um, any questions? So Dr. Sidi, what I think is, uh, let, let me take the SVM together in the next class. Yeah, so I just actually PM, PMD you the same suggestion. <laughs> yeah, so it's been two hours already. Uh, so let's take SVM with the kernelized. So, so, so uh, Sahar can quickly go over the tutorial to just to correlate some of those things with the lecture so far from yesterday and today. Okay. So she has like three, four examples which she can run on collab, and it would be quick. It would be very quick because students can correlate that all these gradient descent and terms they have seen. Where is it in the tutorial? And based on that, they can attempt part one of the assignment, which is doing stochastic gradient descent. Okay, sounds good. Sahar, I Sahar can you just? Yes, sir. Shall I say, uh, share my screen? Yeah, let me stop it. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And if you have any queries, please let me know on campus wire. I would be here as well while Sahar is going over the tutorial. Go ahead, Sahar. So can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So first of all, let's start with linear regression. Let's uh, maybe let's... zoom zoom in a bit, Sahar. Okay. Yeah. 
think this is, this is good. Yeah, thank you. Oh, no, it's too much. Oh, too much, yeah. Mm-hmm. And maybe the left uh, panel, you can it, just hide if you don't need it. Yeah, table of contents, you can cross yeah. it out. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, let's import some important packages for this tutorial. I think you are familiar with most of them. Maybe this one is new. So for linear regression, we are working on California housing data set. So our aim here is to predict the price of the house based on some features of the houses. So uh, the, uh, using this function, using this function, we can fetch the uh, California housing data set. Okay. So as you can see, uh, this function returns this uh, housing data, which is nothing but a dictionary, which contains this 2D array, which are the data from the uh, houses. I think it's uh, 20,640 uh, uh, houses. And it returns as well the feature names. We have eight features, like the median income, house age, uh, average number of uh, rooms, and so on. And we have as well the target, which is the price of the house in $100,000. So is the data set clear? Okay. So after that, uh, we need to rearrange this uh, uh, dictionary in a uh, uh, 2D structure. So we'll use this uh, bandas data frame. Uh, so we have um, uh, this uh, uh, data. Uh, housing data uh, are the uh, features. And uh, we will as well uh, convert this uh, target into a data frame. Then we will uh, join this uh, target with uh, this uh, data set using this join function, which will join two data frames. Okay. Uh, so uh, we can as well uh, check whether any of the columns of the data set has uh, null values. Uh, so this data set doesn't have any null values, so no need to run this now. So uh, the description of the data set to understand the, the data set, which retains the uh, mean standard deviation and all other statistical measures for uh, every column, the data set. So uh, now um, we are going to implement linear regression. So we we'll use only one feature so we can uh, find the best fit of our data set or the best line which fit our data, uh, fits our data. So uh, how to find this feature from those eight features? We'll use something, uh, the correlation function. So the correlation fu- function computes the correlation between every two columns in the data set. So we are interested to uh, know which uh, features which feature of uh, these eight features have the uh, most, uh, the highest correlation with the target. So as you can see, the uh, median income has the highest correlation with the target. So we'll consider this feature. We are looking at the magnitude. So it could have been minus 0.68 also, okay, but it yeah, has to be the maximum. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the maximum. Kasina, okay. you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, this was a doubt I'm having from a long time. Uh, see, if we have a minus value, is it optimum to choose it or not? Minus correlation value? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It just means it's negatively correlated. It's ne- correlated, right? So still choosing it is not uh, going to, like choosing it is better than choosing a smaller value of the correlation, right? Yes. Yeah, but here it happens that uh, this median income has the highest one, right? Yeah, yeah. not in this case. I'm asking. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we are interested now in one feature, which is the median income and the target, which is the price. So we need to understand those two columns. So we'll take this uh, description function. Uh, we can see the mean standard deviation and the quartiles uh, and the maximum. So what you can infer from this uh, uh, data that if you can see the uh, third quartile here, the uh, price is 2.6. 
but the maximum value of the price goes to uh, five. So these um, examples which have um, uh, this high uh, prices are, uh, we can consider them as outliers. So we can just exclude them from the data set. So we do that using this function, uh, this condition. So the new data frame is the old one, but we exclude all the uh, uh, examples which have prices greater than five. So uh, any question? Oh, they are clear, right? Okay. So after that, we need to do some normalization of the data set. So here we want the maximum value of the price or the median income to reach one, to be between zero and one. So uh, we use this normalization that we uh, compute the minimum uh, and the maximum of each column. Uh, then from each element in uh, every column, uh, which uh, are either the uh, median uh, income or the price, we subtract the mean and divide by the uh, difference between the maximum and the minimum. So let's compute it. So this is basically normalizing the features, right? Yeah. So that's something that we, I think, discussed in the lecture also yesterday, that before fitting a regression, you need to normalize the feature so that one feature doesn't have a lot of effect because of its range yeah, exactly. of values. Okay, so after normalization, let's just blot them. So as you can see, there are uh, there is high correlation between the income and the house price. So now uh, linear regression in scikit-learn. So first of all, um, uh, in uh, scikit-learn, we need first of all to build the model, then fit the data, uh, then after that do the prediction. So uh, for uh, fit function, uh, it expect, uh, expects that uh, this uh, uh, array uh, X to be 2D array. But in our case, it's uh, one D array. So if we can print the dimension of X, this X, it's one. So it's uh, one D array. So to convert it to do uh, two D array, we use this reshape function. Uh, minus one means all the rows and one column, this one. So I hope this is clear. So now our uh, uh, X data, it's two D array. So now we can build our uh, linear regression model. So linear regression model, it can uh, uh, has many parameters like uh, if you want to fit the intercept you uh, 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 or not. So the default value here is it true. Uh, uh, you can uh, normalize, uh, uh, normalization here uh, it's uh, subtracting the mean, then dividing by the standard deviation and number of job, uh, jobs. Uh, you can use all the cores or one cores. So for example, if you set it to minus one, you will use all the cores. Okay, so now we'll uh, train on our data set. So, uh, for this line, we have the intercept and the slope. So we can bring them. Any questions so far? So we can pre uh, predict as well the value corresponding to X. And we'll get the same answer if we use this, just the equation the intercept uh, plus the uh, slope multiplied by the x. So now let's draw uh, the best line. Okay. So any question here? 
So let's move to linear regression from scratch. So instead of use this, uh, using of this inbuilt function in scikit-learn, we can just use the equation of the line. So let's define our class. Our class is linear regression. So uh, uh, it has uh, three functions, the uh, fit, uh, coefficient, and uh, the predict. Uh, so in uh, the fit, you can see that we are computing the uh, slope and the intercept. So for the slope, this equation, you can find it in literature uh, and the intercept, the analytical solution. And then we return the, those values and uh, we predict just uh, by using the equation of the line. So let's run this. Okay. Then we do the normalization again. Nothing new. We call this uh, class. Create an instance then. We fit our data. we predict and let's see if now our solution uh, matches this uh, psychic lens solution okay let's bring that and we'll get the exactly the same values from uh, as psychic lens the slope 1.2 and the intercept 0 0.1. Okay, so now let's plot the baseline. Okay. So shall I move to gradient descent or there is any uh, question? So for gradient descent, um, as JD uh, today uh, mentioned in the class, uh, so we need first of all to initialize the uh, uh, parameters, uh, which are the slope and the intercept. Uh, we uh, as well, uh, just here we initialize this uh, empty uh, uh, list for uh, just saving the values of mean square error um, over the e-box. Uh, and um, now for every e-box, we will compute the derivative with respect to uh, the slope and with respect to beam. So this is the same equation as we saw in the class today. And this is the learning rate. You can choose it. It's a hybrid parameter. And uh, we just uh, update the, our slope by uh, subtracting the learning rate multiplied by this uh, delta w or delta m here. And the same uh, for the uh, uh, intercept. And we compute the mean square error between the uh, target and the, um, the predicted value. And we retain the uh, slope, uh, intercept, and mean square error. So now. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So what is that uh, underscore in for loop for underscore in range? Yeah, you can put uh, any value like i or whatever, but oh, we are oh. not using any variable i here. So oh, we just oh. put this bar. Okay, okay. Thank just you. to iterate over the e box. Okay, thank you. Huh? Uh, so now. So we you can, can you can choose that if you want to print number of iterations it took, right? So in that case, mm -hmm. you can have that as a comp. So now just let us plot them. And so we can see that we, this is the uh, best fit and this is the gradient descent. So you can see here that the results are matching. And as I told that as you increase the number of epochs or iteration in this case, you're going to converge to zero, but you're not going to hit zero, right? So in this case, you can, actually start seeing that the it has converged even just around 
20, even before 20, right? I see it's more or less a parallel line before that. So you can estimate to, you can decide to switch off the epochs at the, like, at that point, like five, six, out of five, six iterations. So now, Rich Rikrishan. So for Rich Rikrishan, the basic idea is not uh, to get rid of this overfitting by adding uh, uh, a term to the um, uh, objective function, which is the mean square error. So uh, here we use the same data set, California housing, uh, and uh, we fetch this um, features and target and join them in this data frame as we did before. Uh, the only difference here, we uh, do the pre-processing uh, pre using the embed function in um, scikit-learn. And uh, we uh, use all the features, all the features, uh, the eight feature, uh, features which we have. Uh, and we split our data set into training and testing. So now here uh, you, um, you saw in the lecture that uh, we have uh, this hybrid parameter for regularization. Uh, which we called it lambda in the lecture. Here uh, in uh, scikit-learn, they uh, called it as alpha. So for alpha uh, equals zero, we have uh, just the mean square error as an objective function without any penalty or any constraint. So now... Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, if, alpha would, if alpha would be zero, so it become like MNC plus the objective function, what we call as a lambda uh, slope square. So if lambda is zero, so it would, it consider only MSE only, no? Right. So we'll start with the uh, lambda equal to zero, then we'll just change the values of lambda between zero and 200 in this loop. Okay, so uh, yeah. So for each lambda, we'll uh, see how the, um, uh, this model will optimize the parameters. So uh, for each lambda here, we'll, uh, we'll retain the uh, optimized, uh, optimized value of this um, weight and just blot them. So now um, uh, we just initiate the model, the ridge one. Uh, then we uh, train uh, this model on our data set. So as I mentioned, uh, we just uh, here create that uh, empty uh, data frame, uh, which uh, in, in this data frame will save the weights uh, for each uh, uh, lambda. Uh, so, and uh, we initiate two least for uh, uh, just saving the value of prediction for training and testing. So now inside this loop, we iterate uh, uh, over uh, lambda from our alpha here, uh, from zero to 200. Uh, with step size one. Uh, so for training, uh, <clears throat> as you can see here, we change this alpha, we fit the model, uh, then uh, we compute the coefficients uh, which corresponding to each alpha. Uh, then we save the values of prediction for the um, training data set and testing data set. And uh, this line, the last one, just for uh, every alpha here you can see, just we rename it as estimate. And uh, for each, um, uh, uh, these are our features. So now for each uh, uh, lambda or alpha, we just save all the weights, the optimized weights. So why we are doing that? Let's blot them and uh, infer something from that. So here, if we plot them, you can see when we increase lambda, this uh, median income, uh, the weights of this median, in, uh, this feature doesn't change, which means that this feature uh, affects uh, the model the most. And we saw that when we compute the correlation between the features and this um, uh, output. While, uh, for example, this feature, 
which is population, it doesn't affect the uh, model at all. So the weights are zeros always. You can see the some uh, of the features, uh, just the importance of the feature will be reduced over lambda. So any question? Okay. Maybe you can move to logistic regression. So can we go up to the plot? Okay. And, uh, so this is a, a ridge regression, right? Right, yeah. So the fact that these are, so which ones are constant in this case? Mm, approximately this median income, which has high weight. Okay, and the, dec and the decre decreasing value basically is talking mm -hmm. about shrinkage yeah. right yeah this one so does it infer that this line this blue line the second one basically uh, this its effect starts decreasing as you regularize it more and more and more yeah uh, as we are plotting the uh, uh, lambda versus this uh, uh, estimated uh, uh, parameters from the model right so as we mm -hmm. increase the lambda, the weight of uh, this feature will start to decrease. But the weight of yeah. this uh, feature will not affect uh, by uh, increasing the lambda. Yeah, same so with the average rooms, uh, except that it's in a negative direction. So its magnitude is shrinking. It is also coming closer to the zero line. Right. right. So yeah, that's what the ridge was all about. It was shrinkage of parameters. Yeah. So now coming to the uh, logistic regression. So as we say in the lecture that um, this logistic regression is a classification method. Uh, so we are uh, going to use this uh, diabetes uh, data set and uh, you can just uh, load it from this uh, link. Let me run it. Okay, so uh, we can see that we have here um, eight parameters. Uh, eight features as well, and we have this uh, outcome whether you have the disease or not. Okay. Uh, so uh, now we'll prepare our uh, uh, data frame as well. So we'll take the features as the name of the columns, and uh, the uh, outcome is the uh, uh, our prediction or output. Okay. So then we'll use uh, scikit-learn to split the data into training and testing. Okay. Uh, so here uh, there is this function in uh, scikit-learn logistic regression and we will train our model. Uh, then we'll uh, do this prediction on the test data set. Uh, so now we can uh, blot this confusion matrix using this function. And as well, we can uh, compute this ROC curve. Uh, this is just for plotting the uh, confusion matrix. So if there's any question on the functions, just let me know. Uh, this is for uh, uh, computing the accuracy, precision, and recall. And we'll use it here to compute the ROC curve. So any question? Okay, shall I talk about support vector machine we didn't cover today? Uh, Sahar, I think let's keep that. Uh, maybe we can even merge okay. it with the next assignment. Yeah, 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 SVM would go into the next tutorial. I okay, think, yeah. so that's it. Any question on that tutorial? So I think we'll upload the tutorial for you to like play around it. Maybe try a lasso as well to see how 
choosing lambda can make one of the parameters exactly zero. So you can try implementing lasso from the vector nodes and you can see the effect for the students. Right, thank you, sir. Okay, thank Are you. there, yeah, Google, this tutorial, yeah, this, this would, this is, this was, this, uh, uh, this sheet would be uploaded on the website. I don't know if Sudhakar is here or available to upload it tonight, but by tomorrow, all these materials would be up. In the assignment would be up, which has two questions, but only attempt the first question, which is on doing stochastic gradient descent. The second question is on SVM. You can attempt that later when we teach SVM. Yeah. Okay, assignment is already there, right? Yeah. Okay, any other questions you can unmute and ask guys like there are 29 students only so it's fine we can take it not here if you are, if you don't have any questions please uh, please feel free to exit i know it's a long night today as well so I have a small question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So my question is, um, I think JD, you can. Uh, we were talking about it. The question is, uh, um, generally, stochastic gradient descent should be faster when epoch time is concerned, right? It might take more epochs, but no. But uh, the epoch, like the time interval while executing one epoch so yeah, yeah. Time, should be fast. yes time per uh, time per iteration of per epoch should be quick because you're not waiting I, not per epoch per iteration will be faster okay the per sample let's yeah, say for it per, per iteration update. means per update w yeah per update w so sir what because, is the difference between per epoch and per iteration because i think both are oh. same i think or maybe they are different no 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 so, so epoch is, go ahead jd <laughs> okay so if you if you remember batch uh, gradient descent epoch goes from one to like keep going and every step that w update takes into account all data samples gradients only then you make the first update of w but in stochastic gradient descent you have again t equal to 1 to it goes on till infinity uh, until you decide to stop that becomes the epoch Within that, every W update now no longer waits for the entire N samples to make its first update. So you have another for loop inside the outer epoch loop. That another for loop inside the outer loop goes from, from sample equal to one till N, keep updating W on just one training sample at a time. Now that becomes your iteration. So, so time to compute that one W is now only dependent on one data sample. So that update time is faster than the update of W when it's dependent on the entire gradients from all the data samples. So you can think of it as if you have a thousand samples, then you have done thousand updates to W of stochastic gradient descent compared to just one update of batch gradient descent. In one epoch, right? In one epoch. Yes, in okay. epoch, you have done thousand updates versus one update of uh, GD. Uh, so uh, there is a certain point, right? Like I think this might be this might take more time. This might take less time per epoch, right? So per epoch, I think in general, SGD should be taking more time, right? 
for epoch not for iteration because there are there is another loop that is running inside which is computing uh, again and again uh, gradients uh, and updating the weights for every point but one at a time one point at a time but due to those that's two faster loops, right that's faster that one update is only dependent on gradient from one point compared to so right now you have like vectorized notations in your colab and all these libraries which does all these million calculations in in just once in one command right because these are all vectorized operations but for stochastic gradient descent you have to run it like one item at a time so actually you never run like a full std sorry your voice is not audible so i was saying that is it audible now yeah it's it's audible uh you never run sgd in its uh, original form anyway what mm -hmm. is because uh, that's a waste of computational resources you could be loading multiple samples into the memory instead of loading one sample and uh, have the multiple of them much quicker so you usually do mini batch sgd in some sense so basically You combine eight samples, sixteen samples, whatever you can fit in the RAM, or the RAM, or the or the CPU RAM, and uh, uh, basically take updates of that mini batch. So if you have thousand samples, and you make mini batches of ten ten samples, so basically uh, randomly, like you would choose ten, put it in one batch, another ten. Yeah, it's about I think data locality, right? Like if you bring everything in once, you probably don't have memory to allocate million samples and update. And if you just do one sample at a time, it's like more reads and writes like between CPU and memory. So it will also take a lot of time. So probably you bring in a small batch at a time, which can fit into your RAM, and then work yeah. on it, update it, and then write it back to the disk, create another batch, bring it to the RAM, bring it. Compute on CPU and then write it off. Uh, and uh, with respect to uh, GPUs, what is the, what are the uh, intervals for the batch sizes? I think it's multiple of tens or or because sometimes it's I think it's like powers of two. Powers of two. Powers of two. So for GPU it's power of ten and for uh, CPUs it's power of twos, right? No, no, no. It's the same for both. So for because CPUs, it's all about parallel. It's all about parallelization, right? Because you're doing two, four, eight, sixteen, so you're assigning two threads, four threads, eight threads, sixteen threads, or two CPUs, four CPUs internally. Like it, it can parallelize the code, right? So you want to grow in powers of two whenever you are in working on computers. So irrespective of G GPUs or CPUs, it it just remains uh, powers of two as a general. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, like sc scaling. Yeah. You you can look it up. Uh, I'm I'm not completely sure what happens if you break the law of power of two, but in general, yeah, for both CPU and CPU you use. Power. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Oh, so let's end the meeting. And if you have any questions, let's put it on campus fire. Thank you. All right. Good night. <laughs>